please rise as you are able. We are a new creation of God, built upon the faithfulness of those who have gone before with Christ as head and cornerstone. We are people built by God, and being built, and being reconciled, and being reconciled, a people yet becoming Let us be at peace. Let us be in unity as we rejoice and give thanks for the inheritance we share by adoption. Let us pray. Lord, once we were no people, diverse, separated, walled off from one another. Now, by the great mercy of Jesus Christ, we have been brought together in the church. Old boundaries, old walls have been overcome, bridged, we, who once were strangers, have become family. Today's reading is from Mark, chapter 6, verses 30 to 34, and 53 to 56. When Jesus sent his disciples out to teach and heal, they ministered among large numbers of people. Their work was motivated by Christ's desire to be among those in need. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. 
for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. <clears throat> when they had crossed over, they came to land at Genesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. This is the word of the Lord. Try to picture the opening of our gospel text in your mind. The disciples have just returned from their travels. Earlier in Mark, Jesus had sent them out in pairs, giving them authority over the unclean spirits. The disciples went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Because I spent a lot of time in corporate America, I picture their gathering with Jesus as a first century business meeting. The teams have been off working independently and they've come back to report to the boss. I see them gathered in a circle, perhaps around a table, but more likely just in a group on the ground. In turn, each team of two explains what they did and saw and said while they were carrying out their tasks. In my mind, the boss is listening intently, nodding as the teams report their accomplishments, perhaps asking an occasional question or pointing something out to everyone. The teams are excited because they have done things they never thought they could do and accomplished far more than they ever expected, while the boss is happy because he knew the teams had it in them to do it and they proved him right. The problem with outdoor meetings, though, is that they're easily interrupted. As our text says, many were coming and going. With all the interruptions, the group can't even find a spare minute to eat, much less hold a meeting. So the boss suggests an off-site retreat, a chance to get away from the constant demands of the crowd. Hop in the boat, boys. We'll find a place where we can meet undisturbed. Now, if you've ever been to an off-site retreat for work or for church or anything, you might know that they seldom go as planned. There is no place where Jesus and the disciples can meet undisturbed. Not when everyone recognizes them and knows what Jesus can do. Not when everyone is hungry for more, more healing, more teaching, more of being told that they too matter. To God. And Jesus is unwilling to tell them no. He has compassion for them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus continues to teach and to heal and to be their shepherd. Now, this text with its separate but similar stories of Jesus and the disciples trying to get away from the constant press of the crowds, but unable to do so, doesn't really seem like a lesson very much. The sections seem more like connective passages, bridges from one main story to the next. And in one sense, that is true. Immediately before this text is the beheading of John the Baptizer. Between the two sections of our text, Jesus feeds the 5,000 and walks on water. Those are big stories, 
familiar touch points in the life of Jesus. As we read Mark's gospel, focusing on these big stories and the well-known stories makes it easy to kind of skip over the parts like today's texts. But they are important stuff too. There's good things here, and we can find it if we just take time to look a little closer. Think some more about what the disciples were doing just before our text starts. They were proclaiming that all should repent. Well, okay, pretty much anyone can do that. But they were also casting out demons and curing the sick, things that they thought that only Jesus could do. How would you react if you suddenly found that you had those abilities? The disciples only had those abilities because Jesus gave them that authority. But still, Jesus sent the disciples out to be his hands. And they were. They could do it. Perhaps Jesus was just giving them a taste of what things will be like later, after he's gone. But whatever the reason, you'd think something like that would be a life-changing experience. After all, Working like this, they could cover more ground. More people could be healed and taught. More demons cast out. Jesus' ministry could be spread farther and faster. They were helping to change the world as they knew it. And yet, as soon as the disciples are back together with Jesus, as far as we can tell from the text, it's like they never did any of that. When the 5,000 are hungry and Jesus tells the disciples, you give them something to eat, the only thing they can think of to do is to go and buy some bread. When they see Jesus walking on the water, they think he's a ghost. When they were apart from Jesus, the disciples did wondrous things. <clears throat> when Jesus is there, the disciples no longer do anything. After all, he's Jesus, right? He's the miracle worker. Maybe they thought it would be presumptuous for the students to continue to heal when the master was right there. Or maybe they thought that they no longer had that authority that Jesus had granted them now that they were together again. Whatever their thoughts or assumptions, the disciples behave as if they no longer have the ability to act the way they had when Jesus sent them out. But as the crowds that follow them everywhere demonstrate, so much action is still needed. There's a story about a little girl helping her mother bake bread. The girl is curious about everything. Where does the flour come from, Mama? From the grocery store. Does the grocery store make it? No, the grocery store gets it from the milling company. The milling company takes grain and grinds it into flour. Where do they get the grain, Mama? Farmers grow the grain and sell it to the milling company. Well, how do the farmers grow the grain? From seeds, just like the ones that we planted outside to grow flowers. Where do the seeds come from? The grain plants produce new seeds each year. The girl thinks for a minute, then asks, Where did the first seeds come from, Mama? God made them. Oh. So, if God made the seeds, and they become flour, and the flour becomes bread, then God makes our bread. The mother laughs and says, well, okay, but God has a little help. As Lutherans, we say that Jesus is present here with us today. In the word read aloud, in the word rightly preached, in the bread, and in the wine. 
We say this because we believe in the promises Jesus makes to us. The promise that through Jesus' death, you are made right with God and your sins forgiven. The promise that through Jesus' resurrection, you are saved from the power of death and granted everlasting life. But Jesus has made you another promise. The promise that through him and through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do things you do not think you are capable of doing. You, me, all of us can do more than we think we can when we do it in Christ. And with that promise comes a calling. We are called through our work and our worship and through how we live our lives to make the world a better place. And we can. Just ask your youth who are in Detroit what can be accomplished when we work together in Christ's name through the power of the Spirit. We are called, gathered, and sent to do God's work in the world. God's work. Our hands. So as you go forth into the world this week, know that you are a beloved child of God. And as you welcome home your weary but exhilarated youth and learn how their lives have been changed by the Spirit, Know that you have the ability to do more than you think you can. Maybe you can't heal at a touch. Maybe you can't cast out demons. But working together through and in Christ, you can do so much. And when you return again next weekend, I pray that you will know that you have made a difference in the world. Amen. Please stand as you are able for our sermon song.
gathered by the Holy Spirit and fed by the Word, we come together as the people of God to pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Holy One, give hope to your church around the world and nurture it with a shepherd's care so that all will remember your faithfulness and love. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Restore the earth to the goodness you provided at creation. Protect and renew the quiet places of the world. Hear us, O God. Break down walls and hostilities that divide people and nations. Teach us to be neighbors to each other instead of strangers and aliens. Hear us, O God. Give rest to those who care for others in homes, hospitals, long-term care facilities, and hospice. Be with those who are dying. Comfort those who grieve and heal those who are sick. Hear us, O oh God. Bring calm to those who are troubled because of frantic schedules and lack of leisure. Make this assembly a place of rest and refreshment. Hear us, O oh God. We give thanks that we are citizens with the saints and members of your household. Keep us in communion with all the faithful departed until we join them around your throne. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Into your loving hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abundant mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. service continues with an offering of our gifts.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in his grace. Amen. Amen. We're sending songs, How Great Is Our God. And please stand as you are able. The splendor of the King, all the majesty, that all the earth rejoice, that all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, darkness tries to hide, he trembles at his voice. 
peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. As we exit today, let us take a moment to share that peace with one another.